so this, this species accumulation curve method essentially uses this information. Here's, this is a typical presence-absence matrix. I've got my species here and my effort here. Imagine this is days, okay? And the information that went into these graphs is the first day I got 17 species, the next day I got, up, I got another set of species, so I'm up to 44. I got 11 more the third day, I got eight more the fourth day. And so those data look, sorry, look like this. The first day I got these four species, the second day I got these three species, next day three, next day two, next day two, next day one, next day one. Everybody with me? And so this is a sort of analysis, the accumulation curve approach. You might be forced to use an analysis like this if all you had were somebody's, you know, kind of a typical birder's notes. Uh, I got these 10 species the first day, and the next day, well, I only see, saw two new species, and the third day I saw five new species. But notice, I don't tell you about the species I saw in the first day in my records for the third day, okay? So really, we're ignoring most of the information in this matrix. Really, the data might look like that. This species here, I saw it day one, day two, day three, day four. I missed it on day five, saw it six, seven, eight, missed it two days, and then saw it four days. Now here's, here's the worry about the accumulation curve approach. The rest of my matrix may look like that, which if you just kind of unfocus your eyes, it's mostly ones, or it might look like that. It's essentially the difference between my rabbits and cats world versus my one of everything world, right? In this case, we're seeing a lot of rabbits and a lot of cats and very, well, and no species are we seeing very few of. Notice that after day seven, we detected all the species. Day eight, day nine, day 10, 11, we didn't see anything new. In this case, boy, that's a lot of rare species. Okay, and so yeah, we didn't add anything to our inventory after day seven, but I'd be awfully worried about a fauna like this. So, Again, the point is here, you're not taking advantage of most of the information that's available to you, or most of the information that's usually available to you. So long as each day or each unit of effort you have a complete list of species, you've got a lot more information here. That's the point that I just made. Everybody with me so far? So essentially, what, what's happened since the 80s when Soberon and Jorente published that initial paper is that a lot of really smart people have been thinking about this challenge. Um, in particular, we have the academic offspring of Robert Colwell here. Uh, Thiago is a is a doctoral student of Colwell's, uh, so he probably should be giving this lecture, not me. Um, but a lot of smart people have thought about this, this question now, and so now we have quite a bit of advance beyond that initial work um, from Soberon and Jorente. So there's some, there's some really interesting work, um, particularly kind of in a math and statistics world by Ann Chow. Um, and essentially, you know, many times mathematicians look at a problem and they, 
characterize its dimensions and they characterize its behavior, but they don't really make it tangible and useful to uh, what are sometimes called domain scientists, us, right? Um, and one thing that's really nice about Chow's work is that she's done a very, very good job of always keeping her work accessible back to the domain scientists, back to the biologists who might just want to know, well, what's the best guess of number of species present in this fauna? And so she goes through all sorts of mathematical um, pain to get to an answer that you'll see is actually fairly simple. And it all comes down to this. Same thing we've been talking about for a while. In this world, I've seen everything multiple times. And in this world, I see everything once. My expectation if I'm in this world is that I go out and sample more, I'm going to see cats and rabbits. But in this world, I might well get an ostrich or a zebra or something like that, something different, something not in my inventory so far. So I'm not going to go into huge detail. I'm not going to subject you to, um, to the pain. <laughs> But it's actually pretty, pretty simple. Our starting point has to be the number of species we know are there. Right? So here's a way to think about this. Imagine a frequency distribution, if we were to go back to those presence absence matrix. Imagine a frequency distribution where we count how many times each species has been detected. And imagine there have been, there's some species that have been seen only in one unit of effort. And other species that have been seen in two, and others in three, and others in four, and others in five, and fewer and fewer until we get to detected in every single sample. Right? What about the set of species that have been detected in no samples, even though they're present? So essentially what we're setting out to do is to estimate that leftmost bar in the frequency distribution. The number of species present at the site that have been seen in zero samples. So there was a really fun early uh, example of this where a statistics professor probably was a little bored decided to type all of Shakespeare's sonnets into an early computer and count the number of occurrences of each um, letter combination, each word. And so um, I don't know how many sonnets there are of Shakespeare, but there should be a lot. Let's say it's 50. And the nice thing about sonnets is they have a very um, consistent structure. Same number of syllables, same number of lines, et cetera, et cetera. And so what this, what this statistics professor developed was an expectation of, in any given sonnet, how many unique words are present. How many unique combinations of letters are present. And the question is then, if we were to find a 51st sonnet, and it had lots of novel words, more than you would expect given the 50 we've seen so far, then you might think that it wasn't by Shakespeare, somebody with a different vocabulary, right? So essentially, what this professor was trying to do was to develop an expectation of how many words were in Shakespeare's vocabulary but were not represented in those first 50 sonnets. 
The really funny thing is that a few years later, a sonnet appears that was putatively by Shakespeare. But nobody was sure. And so, what went from a kind of a classroom exercise, a fun exercise, turned into a paper in science <laughs> where this guy said, okay, here's what we know about the frequency of words in Shakespeare's vocabulary. Imagine that I'm talking about species in a particular place. And here is a new sample. How many new words, new letter combinations are present in this new sonnet? And is that within what you would expect from Shakespeare's known sonnets? And the answer was, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So essentially, there was no word-based evidence that that sonnet was not by Shakespeare. Okay? But it was all based on that frequency of the zero detection category. Okay? My dad was actually a, a specialist in, in English literature and he studied Daniel Defoe. Defoe wrote a lot about this part of Africa, in fact, with uh, Captain Singleton and things like that. Um, and near, well, late in my father's life, he was studying uh, Defoe's poetry. And the thing about Defoe was that he rarely, if ever, signed his works. It was never, you know, my book by Daniel Defoe. Rather, he would sign it in somebody else's name, or he would make up a name. He was apparently kind of a shifty guy. Okay, apparently some of his stories were stolen or borrowed or adapted. So especially with the poetry, which a lot of it was, was political, it wasn't a good idea to sign his name. So my father goes through all of Defoe's poetry and we started talking about this Shakespeare example and then all of a sudden my father appears with uh, a digital copy, this is way back, this is like 1988, a digital copy of all of Defoe's poetry. And so he's like, so Talon, can you tell me whether this poem is written by Defoe? <laughs> <laughs> and, well, he didn't, he didn't live long enough to do that collaboration. It would have been a lot of fun to, to collaborate with my dad, but he, he died in 92, so, so no. But this is all about sampling, okay? So, sorry, um, we start with what we know. So that might be the sum total of words that we know are in Shakespeare's vocabulary or birds that we know are in Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens in our sampling so far. But then, ignore this. This is just a correction for, for small sample size. Focus on this. So notice that our estimate of final species diversity is our known occurrences, what we've seen so far, plus this fraction. And what is this? F1 is the species that have been seen with a frequency of one, and F2 is the species that have been seen with a frequency of two, in two samples versus in one sample. And so what Chow derives is that the, um, the number of zero detection species is best expressed as the ratio between the square of the singletons, the square of the number of species detected only once, divided by double the number of species detected twice. Okay? And this isn't just something she made up. She derived it. And in fact, what she really derived was a longer version that had contributions from the species detected three times or more. But in playing with her longer version, 
she finds that really F1 and F2 determine most of the dynamics of the outcome. So most of the magnitude of this term comes from uh, comes from these first two bars in our in our frequency graph. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So if I've if I have seen a hundred species and I have ten species that have been seen only once and ten species that have been seen twice, then there's my hundred species. Ten squared is a hundred, ten times two is twenty. 100 divided by 20 is 5, so I'm guessing that my final inventory will be 105 species, that there are five species in that zero detection category. Okay? And Chow gives us a couple different versions of these equations. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And she also gives us equations for lower and upper bounds. Okay, so that confidence interval that we were needing earlier. Then, um, Chago's major professor comes along and brings in some additional estimators. Uh, I'm definitely not going to go into the details here, but all I want you to pay attention to, this is out of the manual to estimate S, all I want you to see is that, let's see, where is it? We have to deal with incidence data where we're, we're calling rare species things that have been detected less than some number of times. And that's actually a parameter you can set in estimate S. And here's the, here's the critical point. The sample coverage estimate is the proportion of all individuals in infrequent species, in rare species, that are not unique. So essentially what it's getting at is for those rare species, how many of them have been seen only once? That's going to be the critical part. That's going to determine most of the dynamic. So this is ICE incidence coverage based estimator of species richness. Um, and you'll see some, some odd behavior in these things. The formula for ice is undefined when all infrequent species are unique. And in fact, if you look, this also will be undefined because you're dividing by zero. Okay? Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction to um, the steps beyond species accumulation curves.